Hi, welcome back to the classroom. Today we're going to talk a little bit about steam. It's one of the craziest things in science. It's one of the most useful applications of science. And it impacts our lives in ways you'll never really understand unless you take a little bit of time to think through it. So I'm going to show you a few of the things that steam does for you today, whether you believe it or not. We'll talk about pressure, we'll talk about vacuum, since those are two of the concepts that make steam work the way it does. We'll talk a little bit about how it was originally used, the first applications for steam engines. Uh, we'll then talk about a man named James Watt who revolutionized the world by introducing it, the first practical multi-purpose steam engine and then show how that trickled into some of the other industries and capabilities that moved on throughout the, the modern times. So rolling straight into it, we're going to talk about pressure. What is pressure? Well, pressure is really just what it sounds like. It's, it's, it's a force pressing in or pressing out on, on something. So in a bicycle tire, we have pressure. So if, if you've, yeah, I'm sure you've ridden a bicycle. And if you've ever ridden a bicycle with a flat tire, it doesn't work very well, right? So what do you do? You get your bicycle pump and you pump air into that tire up into a specific pressure, usually around 35 to maybe 80 or 90 PSI pounds per square inch. So as you push the air in, that air, the air is held inside an inner tube. And the pressure inside will push out and want to make the inner tube swell up like a balloon. Now, the way the bicycle tire is put together, the outside of the tire and the rim that it's on hold that together so it can only go out so far as you pump more air in and so it'll build up more and more and more pressure. And what that does is that creates a basically an air cushion that you ride on. So when you sit on your bicycle, you, the, the tires will flatten out just enough so that the area that the tire sits on the ground is just big enough so that say at 15 PSI or let's say 30 PSI, if you weigh 90 pounds and you get on a bicycle that's tires are pumped up to 90 PSI or 30 PSI, there will be three square inches of tire touching the ground. If I take that down to 15 PSI, so half of the pressure, I'm going to have twice the area. And if I cut double the pressure, I'm going to have half the area. So when you're riding a bike, the pressure actually inside those inner tubes holds you up because the air inside is pushing up on the bicycle at Fit, at, say 30 pounds per square inch, it's pushing down on the ground at 30 pounds per square inch. And so you're not actually riding on the tire, you're riding on the air inside that tire. For example, if, uh, if I were to get on a bicycle that's tires were pumped up to 35 pounds per square inch, I weigh about 200 pounds, which means that I would need about 5.7 square inches of tire. So about that much tire is gonna touch the ground when I sit on a bike that's tires are pumped up at 35 PSI. Now that works pretty good when you're riding over something soft like sand or gravel, right? You want to spread the weight out so it doesn't dig down in. Now when I ride road bikes, I, I want to have as little contact with the ground as possible because that's where my friction is. I want to be able to ride smooth and fast. And so at that bike, I might pump it up to 100 pounds per square inch. Well, I'm 200 pounds, that means I have two square inches. So it's going to be a block about that big is what's going to be on the ground. Um, so the higher the pressure, the harder it's going to push out, and the less my weight is going to flatten it out to touch the ground. So how do we measure pressure? I, I use the term pounds per square inch, right? And it's basically saying that per one square inch, so a cube about this big, how many pounds of weight is pushing on that one square inch? But when we measure pressure, we don't usually measure actually real absolute pressure. The air around us is pushing in on us all the time, right now. In fact, that's why if you climb a mountain very, or drive up a mountain really quickly, you'll hear your ears pop. Or if you get in an airplane and you take off, you'll, your ears will pop because the pressure drops. Um, but when you're at, say, sitting at sea level, the air pushes in on you actually at about 15 pounds per square inch, so about half of what a lot of your bicycle tires are inflated to. Um, but normally we call that zero. On most of our gauges, you don't just look at a pressure gauge like for a tire pressure gauge and it just sitting in the air, it doesn't say 15 pounds per square inch. That's because we sometimes measure things in what's called gauge pressure where we normalize it to what's the pressure around us and then we measure the difference for another pressure like so when I measure my bicycle 
tire pressure. I'm measuring the difference in the pressure between where I'm at outside at atmospheric pressure, about 15 psi, and inside the bike tire. So if I have a 30 psi tire, and I'm sorry, pressure inside my tire, what I really have, the gauge says I have 30 psi, but it's 15 psi out here. This is 30 psi higher. I'm actually at 45 psi inside my tire. It's kind of kind of strange to think about, but when you look at science um, and the way that physics works, you actually have to work with absolute pressure. Uh, usually, it's not the differences in pressure that matter in a lot of the situations, and so. Just keep in mind that when you have something that says zero PSI, no pressure, like your tire gauge or the gauge on an air compressor, it's not actually zero. It's probably about 15. Now, that's going to vary based on how high altitude you are. Here in Utah, we're about 4,000 feet, uh, 4, 4,500 feet altitude, depending on where you're at. And the pressure here is actually a fair bit lower than the pressure down like in Los Angeles or San Diego, where you're right on sea level. Um, we'll, I'll give you another example of that later with how different it is at Everest to the peak of Mount Everest, the pressure there versus the pressure down low. Now, it's not a really big deal that gauge pressure, you know, the, the, what you measure with your gauge isn't absolute pressure. Really what you have to do is you just have to know that that's what the gauge says and then you have to know what your absolute pressure is and you just add the two together and that's what you use to play with science. The important thing to know is just that there is actually pressure around you right now and we're going to use that to help make uh, steam do work for us. So give you kind of a, a ballpark of what some different pressures would look like. In the deepest part of outer space where there is literally nothing, well it's not true, there's never nothing, but there's just a handful of atoms of like hydrogen and helium. There's really, and they're so far apart they don't even run into each other, there's not enough there to cause any pressure. And so outer space is what they call a hard vacuum. That is truly zero PSI. Um, that's a, as much of a vacuum as you can get. Now, as you move in towards the Earth, where you get a little bit more atmosphere, the peak of Mount Everest, which is you know over 20,000 feet, I don't have the number with me at the moment, that pressure there, in absolute terms, is 4.8 pounds per square inch. It's a third of what the pressure is down at sea level. So for those people that are hiking to the top of Mount Everest, they're hiking up that steep hill, they're doing that with one-third the oxygen that you would normally have. By some of the original um, people who climbed it, like Hillary and Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, the first people who made it to the top of, of Mount Everest, uh, took oxygen with them just so that they wouldn't die. Now at sea level, um, you're about 15 pounds per square inch. That real number is 14.696. It's a, a standardized number. Uh, but that actually varies a little bit. Have you ever heard about barometric pressure and the pressure dropping because of storms coming in? That's actually changes in that number caused by, by storms. When you, so when you say that atmospheric pressure is at 14.696 at sea level, that's an average. And if a storm's coming in, it's going to be lower than that. If a nice warm sunny day is coming in, it's going to be a little bit higher. Below that number, below, below 14.696, we're talking about a vacuum where we have lower than the atmospheric pressure. It's going to want to suck air into it. Uh, when you go above that, you have higher pressures. And so one of the next steps up that I'll talk about is a, is a pressure cooker. If you've ever seen one of these, it's a pan with a lid that screws on with a gasket. It has a little weight that sits on top of a vent. And as you heat it up, it'll start to boil. And it'll start to let a little steam out and rock the, the top of the cap. Well, the reason that they, press, they, put, they put that cap on it is that when you raise the pressure, it actually makes the water boil hotter. And at 30 pounds per square inch, so 15 pounds on the on gauge pressure, it raises the boiling point of water to about 240 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to kill almost all of the bad bacteria and everything else. And they use that for canning like vegetables and things like that, so they, they preserve and last long. It also makes food cook faster and sometimes makes it more tender. So pressure cooker, about 15 PSI gauge, 30 PSI absolute. Um, a soda bottle that you buy at the store, what kind of pressure is inside that? Well, those can be up to 55 pounds per square inch. This, by the way, is why they explode if you shake them up and pop the top. Um, your car and truck tires uh, can be anywhere between about 35 pounds per square inch gauge pressure up to about 120 for a semi-truck or a, a heavy trailer uh, tire. 
uh, going on your inside your refrigerator, there's actually a little compressor in there. That's part of what makes it cold. And that compressor is going to pump the refrigerator, refrigerant, the stuff that makes it cold, up to 165-ish PSI uh, as part of the process to make it cold. Now, next step up, I'm going to talk about some higher and higher pressures. Anything above about 165, maybe 200 pounds per square inch is kind of unusual in a normal environment um, for just typical air pressures. But if you've ever used, like, um, I've seen a tractor with a forklift on it or, or a loader on it, or you've seen an excavator that scoops out dirt, uh, makes big holes, those are all run by hydraulics. And inside of that system that, that moves those pieces with hydraulics, that the hydraulic oil is at a pressure of around 3,000 pounds per square inch. Uh, enough that if it starts leaking and spraying out, you can actually cut your fingers off by just running it through that spray. It's kind of, kind of crazy, a little bit dangerous, but it's actually really, really useful. Uh, another example, and I'll have a picture of this one, is, uh, is a, a, the air tanks that firefighters use to go into a, a fire. Now this one's near and dear to my heart. I'm a part-time uh, volunteer firefighter. Inside my air tank, there's about 4,500 pounds per square inch of air. And that makes it so that inside an air tank about this big, I can, I have enough air that I can breathe for between about 30 to 45 minutes while I'm fighting a fire so I'm not sucking in all the poison gases and bad smoke and all the awfulness inside of a fire. That's a really important thing for me. But that pressure requires some, some respect. I, when, I, when we work with the tanks, we fill them up. We're very cautious with how we do it. And we'll actually kind of be, we'll put them inside big metal cans when we're filling them up in case they blow up because that's enough pressure to really cause problems if it all came out at once. Uh, the highest pressure you'll see naturally uh, on, on the earth without some sort of like explosion or energetic reaction is going to be at the bottom of the Mariana Trenches, at least the deepest place we can get to. Now, if you go to the core of the center of the earth, those pressures are going to be astronomical. I don't know what they are. They're really high. But at the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean, where we've sent people in a submarine, it can be 15,750 pounds per square inch. So every inch, every piece of the submarine that big has 15,000 pounds pushing on it all around it. So if you see pictures of some of these, these deep submarines, you'll notice that they're spherical to help hold out the pressure. And their walls are really thick and they're made out of special materials that are super strong. Um, tons of pressure down there. And then kind of the highest range that, that you might encounter. Um, one of my hobbies, I like to shoot. And so I know a little bit about bullets. And if you look at like a 22 long rifles, this is often the first gun that, that you'll have a young child shoot or, or a, a new shooter. They're, they're kind of quiet. They don't make a lot of noise. They, they're not big and scary. Inside the barrel of that thing, it can produce up to 35,000 PSI of pressure. If you get up to a large um, Magnum rifle caliber, that would be up to 65,000 PSI. And I think the Army just adopted a rifle a new one here very recently that I've heard gets up to 80,000 pounds per square inch of pressure so it can push that bullet very fast down the barrel. So some nominal ranges for pressures of various types of things give you a feel for it. Now we're not going to play with pressures that are super high. This is kind of dangerous, right? So why does it happen that steam can make so much pressure? When you boil water, it turns into steam, right? You've all seen this before. Um, and you notice that when you make a big cloud of steam, it doesn't seem like very much of the water goes away. That's because when water turns into steam, it expands by a factor of 1,700 times if you leave it at, this, at just regular atmospheric pressure. So what that turns into is that about a teaspoon of water is going to turn into 2.2 gallons of steam. Now, if I try and squish that steam into a smaller container, what's going to happen is, is that more of it's going to stay water, but the water is going to get hotter and hotter, and the steam is going to get hotter, and the pressure is going to get higher and higher and higher. So as an example, if I could have a container that could hold the pressure, and I put water in it, and I could get it up to 300 degrees centigrade, so three times its boiling point, so it's about 572 degrees Fahrenheit, if I could get it that hot, it would the pressure inside of it would be 1,228 pounds per square inch. That's a lot of pressure. 
And if, if you look at some of the, um, the, the, the applications for steam, they'll actually do that. You'll be running pressures that are in that neighborhood. Now, I'll do a demonstration for this, and, and we'll switch frame to that here in just a second. The, but we're not going to be anywhere near those kinds of pressures. What we're going to do is we're going to drop a little bit of water inside of a tube, a copper tube that's been sealed on one end. I'm going to only put in about a teaspoon of water, and I'm going to stopper it up with a cork so that everything's stuck inside. The, the gases aren't going to come out. And I'm going to heat the water until it boils, and as it starts to boil, the pressure inside is going to build. And basically what I've got here is a pop gun. You're going to see the cork pop out. It's going to make a little bit of noise, and it's going to fly across the room. All right, so we're here outside of Curious Minds classroom with a couple of random looking things on the table. I apologize, there's a little bit of wind going. I've got the wind sock on the microphone. If you still hear it, it's just best I can do, uh, timing being what it is. You might also hear some gunshots in the background depending on how directional the microphone is. That's the uh, Sportsman's Ranch next to us that uh, likes to shoot uh, pretty much all day every day. So not a lot I can do about that. Hopefully it doesn't bother you too much. But, so I'm gonna go grab some safety glasses and we'll be right back. All right, so I got my safety glasses on. Anytime you're working with pressure, you wanna make sure that you have protective equipment on, especially around your eyes. If pressure releases suddenly, that's uh, often referred to as an explosion, and it can send stuff flying all over the place, and the last place you want it is in your eyes. So always wear something in front of your eyes, and if you're dealing with high pressures, there's other safety measures you wanna take into account as well. For this, eyeglasses or safety glasses are probably fine. I am deliberately gonna send this thing flying. I'm gonna hold it in a way that it goes someplace safe, that's why we're outside, is I don't want to be breaking anything in my house. Now, the way this works, it's not going to go really far. It's not going to go very fast, but safety is safe. Um, patent that quote. All right, so I'm going to take my copper tube. It's sealed off the end. Nice solid tube down the middle. This will hold several hundred PSI if I go to pressurize it. I'm not going to generate anywhere near that much pressure. I'm going to put down the throat of it just a few drops of, of water, maybe a teaspoon. And I'm going to cork it up as tight as I can get that cork in there. The tighter the cork, the more pressure will build before it comes out, and the louder the pop and the farther the cork will go. So that's wedged down in there nice and tight. Now you can do this over your kitchen stove. I don't recommend it because you're probably going to send this flying somewhere in the kitchen where there's glass or other things that are sensitive and break them. Your mom probably won't appreciate that. Um, if you decide to do this experiment, I recommend using something like a torch or a camp stove outside where there's plenty of room for it to go. And always remember, steam is hot. Steam is always hot, and it's always hot enough to burn you. And the thing that gets the water hot enough to make steam is hot, you must have some way to hold it without getting hot. This copper pipe, if I heat it on this end, is it gonna get hot enough up here to burn my fingers. So I'm gonna use a pair of pliers to hold on to it. So we'll hold it in this direction. We'll heat the end where the water's at and see what happens. So I'm gonna go ahead and light my torch. steam-powered pop gun. All right, hope you enjoyed that. So, um, what's the opposite though of pressure? And it's a vacuum. That's when I suck all the molecules out. I don't have them. The pressure actually comes as the molecules in the air run around. They basically, they're always moving. Everything in, in, the, in the universe is always moving. Uh, and what happens is as a molecule moves through the air and it runs into something, it bounces off. Now, if you've ever like run into your brother, and bounced off, you kind of notice that both of you end up recoiling off. If, if, if the air molecule comes in and hits my hand and then it runs back, bounces off that way, it's actually going to push my hand that way. But sitting here, I've got air molecules sitting this way, pushing my hand that way. I've got air molecules coming this way, pushing my hand that way, and they kind of cancel each other out, right? Um, and so I don't feel that pressure, but that pressure is really, it's just the air molecules going in random directions, running into things. If I take all those air molecules out, I don't have any pressure left. And that's why in outer space, that's hard vacuum, zero pressure. Now, what does that do? So a couple things that you'll see in, 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 in around that use a vacuum. Uh, first, a light bulb. Now, these are actually getting kind of rare. They don't use light bulbs like this too much anymore. They mostly shifted to LEDs, but these are super common when I was a kid. 
And inside of there, there's a little wire that you run electricity through. And when you run the electricity through it, it gets hot. We'll actually talk about why that is and why it looks like it does in a couple lectures down when we talk about black body radiation. But the problem is if you get a metal hot and it's in the atmosphere where there's oxygen, the metal's going to react with that oxygen and it's going to rust and it's going to fall apart and you're going to blow up the light bulb. Uh, this is actually why it took Edison so long to figure out how to build a light bulb that would last is those filaments, they, didn't, they couldn't get a strong enough vacuum or they didn't have a material that was stable enough so it would react and it would just blow the filament up and it quit working. The secret was to get a material that, that was a little less reactive, so an original um, Edison light bulb was, I think it was carbonized silk, so carbon, and then they would suck all the air out of the bulb so there was nothing to react with it. Now they use uh, tungsten wire because it's a little more heat tolerant, lasts even longer, makes it brighter, you can get it hotter so it makes a brighter white, white light. Um, but it's also part of why light bulbs are so dang fragile. It's a thin glass layer, and remember now, it's got 15 psi of atmospheric pressure pushing in on it, but there's no pressure on the inside pushing against it. And so basically, it's like that light bulb has a vice grip on it all the time just trying to crush it. And it's under a lot of stress, and it doesn't take a whole lot more of, of, of energy in it to break the light bulb. I don't know how many light bulbs I've broken over the years because they're so fragile. Uh, another one is my drink cup. Inside of here, there's a there's a, an inner inner cup inside, and there's an outer cup, and between those two is an empty space. When they make these, they pump all the air out of them and make a vacuum. Why is that? Well, it turns out vacuums don't conduct heat very well, so they're a great insulator. The cold on the inside, the only way it has to get out is to kind of go up and around and out the edges of the metal. Where like on a regular cup, you can just kind of work right through the plastic or through the, the ceramic or metal or whatever it's made out of. Um, these are very effective uh, unless you happen to break them. If you ever have to work with something like liquid nitrogen, which is just super, super, super cold, it's a couple hundred degrees below zero. The only way you can keep it liquid is in something called a dewer, which is a glass cup that has a vacuum in it so that it's a very, very good insulator. I've broken a few doers because, well, they're like a light bulb, they're kind of fragile. All right, so that's vacuum. So, what's that have to do with steam? Well, just like when I heat steam and it expands, when I cool it, it contracts. And if the steam goes in and pushes everything else out, pushes out the air, you know, the nitrogen, the oxygen that's in the air, gets rid of it, displaces it, and all I have is steam, and then I cool that steam, it shrinks back into water, and what's left in all that space that used to have steam? Nothing. It makes a vacuum. In fact, it can make a pretty strong vacuum. Uh, as an example, I'm going to show you here a demonstration in just a second where I'm going to use atmospheric pressure, 15 psi or just normal air, to completely crush a pop can by sticking it in cold water. So we've already demonstrated what happens when you generate pressure inside of this tube with steam. Shot a cork halfway across my yard. Might be able to find it later, we'll see. Now, on the flip side, steam can create a vacuum. When you condense and cool the steam, it pulls in and makes a small amount. So, just like with the metal, with the, the pop gun, I'm gonna shoot just a little bit of water down in the side of the bottom of my can here. It's maybe, I don't know, a tablespoon worth, maybe a couple teaspoons. Now I'm going to heat it up, so I'll light my torch again. Come on. I'm going to hold on to it with pliers so that I don't burn myself. I'm going to let it heat up until the, pretty much the whole can's good and hot. And I have a good amount of steam coming out. I'll let it go just a little bit longer than that, just to make sure that I don't have any more cotton condensing um, water on the outside of the can. There's a good amount of steam going now. Just a few seconds longer. I don't want to go too long because I don't want all the steam to totally disappear. And right about now I'm going to flip it over and put it in the ice water. Now, you probably heard that big crunching sound and that was the pop can crushing itself. And look, there's not a whole lot of space in there anymore. And the space there is has a decent amount of water in it. So that's using a vacuum to crush a can. All right, so what'd you think of that? 
pretty impressive. I, I, you know, the first time I saw that trick, I didn't think, I thought maybe they grabbed a hold of it and they crushed it with the pliers or something else, but no, that's just the atmospheric pressure pushing in on a vacuum created when you rapidly cool the steam inside that pop can. Okay, so who was the first person to realize that we could get energy out of steam, that we could do something with it? Uh, the real answer is we don't know. Uh, it could have been somebody way, way back in prehistory. But the first documented example I'm aware of is uh, Hero of Alexandria. So he was around uh, the first century AD in Alexandria in northern Egypt, and uh, right on the Mediterranean coast. He was a Greek who lived in a Roman city in Egypt. Um, one of the things he's credited with is the Aeolipili. I probably said that really wrong, don't really care. Somebody will tell me the right answer later, but it was really kind of the first steam engine. Totally impractical, it was just a toy really, but it did demonstrate that you could use steam to make motion. And what he did is he had a pan with boiling water in it. Nothing fantastic, right? We've all done that a hundred times. But what he did that was a little different is he put a lid on the pan and he poked two holes in the lid and up out of that lid he had two pipes that bent into a ball. And so the, the lid would catch the steam, send it up the pipes into the ball. And the ball was set up so that it could spin on those pipes. And off two ends of the ball were some bent nozzles or jets that would blow the steam one to the left and one to the right. And what happens is as the steam goes out of the jet, it pushes the nozzle backwards a little bit. This is the way rockets work, it's the way jet engines work. It's an it's an example of Newton's third law of motion a full 1600 years before, no sorry, about 1500 years before Newton was alive. Um, I don't know that he understood the full concept, but this is really demonstrating Newtonian mechanics early on. Uh, could you do much with this? Not really. You could impress the nobles, probably, you know, make, make good dinner conversation with it. But it did show that, that steam has potential. So the real question is, how do you go about getting something out of it? All right, so one of the first practical uses for steam energy was the new Cummins steam engine. And what, the way the system works, there's a nice little graphic I'll put up on the screen here. On the right-hand side, in the purple and blue, is a boiler. So at the bottom you have a fire, probably coal fire, if it was, because this was all developed in England, and their primary fuel source at this point was coal. Heating water in it in a boiler, and you can see it's a little insulated around the outside edges of it. That's to keep as much heat in as you can, because you don't want to waste the heat. The heat's just your energy. And as it generates steam, a valve opens, and it goes up into what's called the cylinder. That's the kind of fork shape going up the side. And it's actually a round piece. The flat part, or that kind of T-shape moving up and down, has a flat round piece called a piston that basically plugs the end of the cylinder. And as the steam goes in, it blows, it tries to blow the cylinder up like blowing up a balloon, but because the sidewalls can't move, it just pushes the piston up. And so as the, steam, as the pressure rises, it pushes the piston up. Now when it gets to the top, they shut the steam valve because you don't want to blow it all the way off. And there's a couple things you can do. One, you can just wait until it cools off, and as the steam slowly condenses, it'll suck that piston back down. It's really slow. It takes a lot of time. A faster thing to make to help is they, they'll open another valve, squirt some cold water into it, just like we did with the pop can when we were, when we were um, crushing the pop can. So they squirt the cold water in, the steam condenses, <laughs> creates a vacuum. You get 15 psi of pressure on the top, zero psi on the bottom of the piston, and it just pushes that piston right back to the bottom. When it gets to the bottom, you know, they close the, the water valve, they open up the steam valve, and they start the process over again. In early versions of this, they would actually have a man whose job was to close one valve, open the other, close, open, close, open, all day long. Um, the only real application for this, though, was pumping water out of mines or pumping water to go fill a reservoir to drive a water wheel because the rate at which it went up and the rate at which it came down were were different so it kind of ran herky-jerky and it was really slow so it didn't gain a lot of a, a lot of use um, wasn't wouldn't put into practice a little bit I think there's a couple of these that are still functional in museums in, in England mostly uh, there might be one uh, in a few other places but it didn't get wide acceptance because just just wasn't quite good enough. 
So along came a man named James Watt. Uh, if, you've ever, if they think the name Watt sounds familiar, it's because that's the unit of measure we use for power. Uh, we named it for him because he named other units of power that ended up being pretty, uh, uh, pretty influential, and it all started with a steam engine. So what did Watt do that was so different? Here's a, a diagram of, that came off of his original patent for his steam engine. And it's a little harder to see than the last graphic. Uh, I didn't really have uh, another one available that was going to work, and I didn't really have the time to draw one up. But you can see what, right here where it, the piston is. It's a cylinder, just like with Newcomen's engine. At the top of it is a piston. Down below it, you see kind of some bricks, and then there's two little open channels down to uh, a tank of heated water, hot water, so that's under a, a boiler and that's making steam that goes up through those pipes and into the cylinder. So just like Newcomen's engine, the steam would be in, there, there'd be a valve open, steam would go into the bottom of the cylinder, push the piston to the top. Now with Newcomen's engine they would squirt water into the cylinder to cool it off, but that actually wastes a lot of energy because the next time I go to shoot steam in the cylinder it's not going it, it, when that steam, hot steam, first touches that cooler cylinder wall, it condenses on its own, and so I have to heat the whole cylinder up. It takes a lot more time, and it actually wastes a lot of energy. So Watt thought about it, and he decided that, you know what, it'd be better if I could cool that steam off somewhere else so I could keep my cylinder good and hot. And so what he did is he created what's called a condenser. So down on the bottom, on the right-hand side over here, uh, next to the boiler, you have what's called a condenser. So there's a um, kind of a cylinder in there, and it's surrounded by cold water. And so if you follow the plumbing, it goes from the top of the cylinder. There's a valve that when the valve, when this piston gets all the way to the top, it opens up. It opens up a valve, and the steam can, that's now it's under pressure will push itself down through the piping and into the condenser. Now once that hot steam hits that cold condenser, it cools off very rapidly and it condenses. But remember, what happens when steam makes a when steam condenses? It makes a vacuum, and so it's going to pull and suck all the rest of that steam out very rapidly. And as the rest of that steam condenses, it makes more of a vacuum until it's just sucked all that steam out and converted it down into water over here in the condenser. And my cylinder is still good and hot. Well, I created a vacuum. What's that going to do to my piston? It's going to suck that piston straight down. So what does the condenser do for me? One, it makes it so that I can cool the steam very quickly. I can keep that, that water nice and cold, especially if I have a water source like a stream or some or a lake nearby. And I can also if heat, uh, sorry, raise my piston very quickly because I'm not having to reheat the cylinder. So I can now make my piston move up and down at a much more regular rate. And suddenly my steam engine is suitable for things like powering uh, weaving machines or machining equipment or um, again he still used it for pumping mines out. Now we'll talk about some of the applications here in just a minute but this was the original patent. Now he didn't stop there. There's a, you still had a little bit of a problem. One of the challenges you run into with Watt's original engine is that even when you create a really strong vacuum, you only have 15 psi pushing back down on the piston to make it go to the bottom. If I'm trying to lift something really heavy, or if I want to lift it very fast, I don't want to push hard on that. I don't want to wait, or if, say if I wanted to lift up some very heavy thing, if I can only push 15 pounds per square inch, and I don't need to lift a, you know, a million pounds, I need lots of square inches, so I have to have a huge piston. Um, he and his team thought about it, and they spent some time thinking, working with it, and they created what's called the dual action steam engine, or dual action piston. And so what they do, here's a graphic animation of it, is you inject steam on one side of the piston, and you blow the piston one direction. And then you shut off that steam and you open another valve so that the steam can get out and then you sh shoot steam in the other side and it drives it back and so you just have this game of opening and closing valves pushing the piston back and forth and back and forth when you think about most modern steam engines when i say modern uh, most steam engines that you might actually have seen in person this is the way they're built if you look at a train an old steam engine train you'll have the drive wheels and they'll usually be the big ones kind of right in the back of the engine 
one, two, three, four, kind of depending on how big the steam engine was. And they'll be connected by these long rods to a cylinder. And that cylinder is not always very big. Uh, and if you watch video on YouTube or anywhere else of a steam engine running, right where that cylinder is at, you'll see steam puffing out constantly. So you don't bother cooling the steam off. You just shoot it out in the air and let the air cool it off. It's not your problem anymore. When you do this now, I can push on that cylinder with more pressure and I can push on hard, I can lift heavy things, I can move it fast. In fact, you can make these things turn much, much, much faster than you ever could with the original um, watt design and way faster and way more smoothly than you could do with the new coming design. One of the last innovations was a way to transition from this up, down, or left and right motion into round circular motion, because that's more what we do, right? We make wheels go around. On a locomotive wheel, you'll notice that, it's, that they've tied that rod to the top of the wheel, and as it pulls to the right, it makes it come down and around. And by it comes down here, it pushes to the left, and it comes back around. And that kind of reciprocating uh, motion like that ended up in uh, steam engines and then into modern internal combustion engines. Super innovative thing that really changed the world for us. All right, so where did where did we start for applications? Watt had to sell this to somebody uh, to get money to invest and, and use to develop further and frankly to pay his bills. Well, the big application at the time was coal mines. So in England especially, all the coal mines are down below the water table. And what that means is when you dig a deep enough hole and you leave it there, it's going to fill up with water up to where the level of the water table is. It's kind of hard for miners to dig coal when they're having to stand in water. Scuba hadn't been invented yet, and it's still kind of a waste of, of, of resources to try and dig with air tanks on. So what they did is they would create these treadmills. And what it was is, if you've seen like a hamster wheel, right? When the hamster gets in the wheel and he just runs on it and it goes around and around and around. Keeps the hamster happy. Well, it turns out hamsters weren't the first ones to do that. They'd make treadmills and they'd have to have people or donkeys or horses constantly walking in these treadmills to run a, to run a pump. And in the, the picture here, it's a donkey and you'll notice that he's on this circular mouse wheel. Across the middle of it is a beam and on that beam is a rope. So as the donkey walks, it, that rope is on the end of a bucket that's down in, and it pull, the donkey will walk and it'll wind that rope up and pull the bucket up out of the, out of the mine. And it gets to the top, you dump the bucket out, and then you reverse, turn the donkey around, it goes back down, you drop the bucket back down to the bottom of the well, and you just keep doing that over and over and over again. These mine owners had to maintain huge stables of horses because you can't make a horse or a donkey or a human work around the clock. Uh, and so if you needed 15 horses to, at a time to pump the water out, you needed probably 45 horses because you needed three shifts of them so that the horses could go rest, so they could eat, so they could sleep. Pretty expensive. Well, one of Watt's biggest innovations was he decided that he needed to be able to market this thing to the mine owners in terms of numbers they understood. And so he came up with the unit called horsepower. He sat and he calculated how much water could a horse lift out of a given depth per hour or per day, I can't remember exactly, per unit time without wearing itself out, right? You know, a horse can generate a lot of power in a short, short run. If you've ever watched horse racing, they can go fast. But if they go fast for very long, they end up wearing out. So if you want a horse to ride a long day, you're going to walk him kind of slow. So how, at that rate, how much work can a horse do? figured that out, did the same kind of calculation with his steam engine, and he would label his steam engine as being a five horsepower. So this thing could do the work of five horses. And then he could go to a mine owner and say, that's a table of 45 horses, I can replace that with one machine, or two machines, or three machines. And oh, by the way, you don't have to have the stable hands, you don't have to buy the food, you don't have to clean up the manure. This thing will work all day, you just gotta feed it coal and water. The, uh, the it took off. The mine owners couldn't get enough of it, and it wasn't very long before people found other applications for it. So they were running pumps for water pumps for fire engines. Some of the I've seen some graphics where there's a fire crew responding to a fire. I think in New York City, where they're careening around a corner with six horses pulling a, a, a steam fire pump, 
that's going to go pump water out of the Hudson River to put out a fire, and it's shooting sparks and flames out of it. Fight fire with fire, right? That's the way they did it. Some other applications for it, um, I think I mentioned already that they used it for powering mills, um, turning cotton and wool into fabric. You know, spinning fat, uh, yarn into thread and weaving thread into fabric was a very labor-intensive process, and it wasn't really consistent, right? The kind of fabric like the shirt that I'm wearing would have been something that was almost impossible back in the day. And even if it were possible, this is the kind of thing that a king would have worn, not some random dude like me. Um, that is all possible because we could mechanize and we could make it happen on a machine that was turning at a regular rate that didn't need a lot of maintenance and babysitting. I didn't have to have, you know, have it on a, on a river by a water wheel. I could put it other places. Um, machining and milling parts and pieces, right? I, if I need to make a, a custom piece for a machine, I need machines to do that. Uh, the first couple were probably built by hand and they were not they were pretty clumsy, but getting precision, precision machining done was important and it took steam engines to do it. Sawing lumber, uh, milling grains for food, uh, you name it, it was driven by steam originally. If we'd use electricity for it, and they did something equivalent back in the day, it was probably steam powered. Another great application was steam shovels. I remember as a kid growing up thinking that every excavator, anything that dug with, with diesel power was a steam engine or steam shovel because that was the term that I grew up with. Now, I'm not that old. The steam engines were actually all gone by then, but it was the term that was still around. And then this picture right here is a steam shovel from, I think, about 1913. It's digging out the Panama Canal, which if you don't know much about it, go look it up. The Panama Canal changed the world and changed transportation around the globe in ways that are just impactful even today. Uh, it would never have been possible without the steam engine. That boulder that that steam shovel is holding up right now uh, is, I don't know how many tons and tons of rock. And prior to a steam shovel, the only way you're going to move that thing is blasting it to smaller pieces and hauling them out chunk by chunk by chunk. It would take forever. Steam shovels dug the Panama Canal. They built railroads and highways. They dug mines to produce the copper and the iron and the tin and the lead for the materials that actually drove the Industrial Revolution. The steam engine created the materials that made steam engines, right? Uh, it, it was one of these things that just made... you could move in a day things that would have taken months and years before. Another place that it totally revolutionized was travel. Uh, the steam locomotive at first um, struggled a little bit with acceptance because people were pretty slow to accept new technologies and there were some kind of public accidents. When you overheat a boiler it tends to do bad things especially if it's not built well it can explode. If you want to see something interesting YouTube what happens when the pressure relief valve fails on a water heater and the water inside gets too hot and, uh, and explodes the water heater. There's some YouTube channels and, and I think Mythbusters did an episode on it. Uh, boilers on trains and plan uh, trains and boats and other applications of steam engines would do that if you didn't take care of it right, if you didn't maintain it right, if it wasn't built right. Uh, so there was some hesitation, but with the locomotive, one good example is where I live. I'm, I'm in the northern end of Utah, not too far from Salt Lake City. And when the original pioneers moved here, it was by, by ox cart and wagon. And it would take months of arduous journey. You basically walked every step of the way and you thought really hard about everything that you were going to bring because it had to fit inside of a wagon that was smaller than the bed of my pickup truck for you and your family of, you know, five, six, seven, eight people. You really couldn't take much with you. And oh, by the way, in that had to be all the food for several months for you and your family. Um, really, really tough journey and tough people that made it. Well, not too long after, in the 1860s, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad was built. Late 1860s and 1870s. After that railroad got put in place, that trip that used to take months, you could do in a week. And during that week, you're sitting on a train. You're not walking, you're not hauling. Uh, when it used to take months and months to move goods from one side of the country to the other, I could do it in weeks. 
Uh, prior to the railroad, one of the most precious commodities here in the, in, the, in the Midwest, Mountain West, was iron. Because it was so heavy, it was hard to move, it would take forever. They would burn down old buildings and old wagons just to recover the nails and the fittings and brackets so they could reuse those and, and have the blacksmith turn them into something else because you just couldn't get iron. When the railroads came, I can move cartloads of it. I can move train loads of it. Uh, suddenly simplified things. Steamships and boats, for the first time in history, sailors weren't subject to the winds. You could go with the direction you wanted to go, whether it was upstream, downstream, didn't matter. You just turn the, turn the steam up a little bit and off you go. Really revolutionized travel in ways that then the only thing that has come close was the invention of the, of the, of the jet engine and modern air travel. The last place where steam has totally impacted everybody's life. I guarantee you that you are currently right now benefiting from steam. Almost all the electricity generated around the world is done with steam. You might think, well, no, no, it's, it's nuclear power, it's coal, it's natural gas. No, all of that pretty much is steam. What they do is they use those fuels, whether it's coal and natural gas or a nuclear reaction, to make to get hot. And they take that heat to make steam and then blow the steam across the turbine that spins and makes electricity. This picture is a picture of a, pal of a power plant. And I remember thinking that anytime you saw that cooling tower like that, that was a nuclear power plant because of some of the media when I was growing up. And you may have experienced the same thing. Well, it turns out this one is a nuclear power plant. Those two kind of cylinder-shaped buildings behind it are where the nuclear reactors are. That's where they heat the water up super hot. Um, right behind those is probably where the, the turbine buildings are, where they, they shoot the steam across the generator, and the generator makes electricity. And then they bring the steam over here to cool it off. And, uh, and so they can close the loop and come back around. Almost all electricity is made with steam. So... If you don't believe that steam impacts your life, think a little bit more about it. If you like electricity, you can thank steam. If you like being able to move cargo, you can thank steam because it put all the infrastructure in place and made it possible. Now, we don't use steam so much for transport anymore, right? We tend to use diesel or gasoline or jet fuel. Um, but without the railroad, you would have never been able to build the infrastructure to build cars, to build roads. Uh, without steam, you couldn't have had the railroads. Now, we use uh, diesels now on the railroads, but that would never have happened without steam. Okay, so uh, for today, I'm going to give you some candidate projects to do at home. Uh, these, some of these you have to do a little bit of your homework on your own. Go, go search out some instructions. Uh, the first one, try, try crushing a pop can the way I did it. All that takes is a, is a soda can, some source of heat. You can use your uh, your stovetop range at home. It doesn't have to be flame. Anything that'll get hot enough to boil water. A pair of pliers that you can hold onto the can with, and some cold water. Uh, option two: go visit a museum that's got an old steam engine at it, and see if you can identify the boiler. See if you can find the cylinder and piston. If you need to, go find a docent. Those are the guys that wander around museums answering questions. They'll be excited to talk to you about it. See if you can recognize the parts of a steam engine. Uh, the third one is build, it's called either a pop-pop boat or a putt-putt boat. Uh, you can find instructions online. It uses a little can candle. You take pieces, I think, from a soda can and a few other common parts, a straw, and you'll make a little boat that can putt-putt-putt around a, a, a little plate of water or in your bathtub using steam. Now, one caution, steam is always hot. If it's not hot, it's not steam, and it will burn you. So you need to do these projects carefully and with, your, with parental supervision and uh, with their okay. If your parents aren't cool with it, don't do it. Um, that's it for today. Good luck, and we'll see you next time.